Christ's peace be with you. As we gather to worship God on Good Friday, let's breathe deep into the solemnity of this day and ask for the peace of God's Spirit with us. They took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Four Gospels record Jesus saying seven different things while hanging on the cross. Traditionally called the seven words from the cross. Today during our service we will reflect upon those seven sayings. Two others also, who were criminals, 
were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. The first word, the word of forgiveness. When the summer bushfires ripped through the homes of many in this part of the world, they exposed toxic building materials and other harmful stuff. As a result, the clean-up before the rebuild is a long, slow, difficult process because in so many ways over the years we have done things and put things into the world without knowing what we were doing. Sometimes we are our own worst enemies. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus demonstrates, even on the cross, what he asks of his followers. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Might I reserve some of that love for those parts of myself that act without knowing or thinking? For when we fail to be the loving creatures God makes us to be, Jesus doesn't forget or forsake us, not even on the cross. He offers hope for a new beginning out of great brokenness. A new beginning for us and for the world. Jesus says, Forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. What do you hear in this? What do you see? Where does ignorance bring pain in your life, in the world? What forgiveness do you seek here at the cross? What forgiveness are you called to offer here? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Christ, Lamb of God. 
One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The second word, the word of salvation. The coastal scrub around Malakuta is stark in its lifelessness. Nothing could survive the furnace it went through. But remarkably, a couple of months after the fires, some fragile little tufts of green are appearing. The garden of creation is regrowing, even from this scorched and lifeless ground. A garden also grows in Luke's Gospel as Jesus is mocked and abused on the cross. Save yourself, the taunters cry. Golgotha is a barren place, inhospitable to new life. But to the one who is willing to see things differently, the criminal hanging next to him, Jesus offers a vision of God's garden. You will be with me in paradise. Paradise, the garden of God's delight, the new creation of hope, peace and love. And you will be with me there today, says Jesus. Because even here in the deathliest place, in fact, in this place above all other places, here where you might least expect it, the garden is growing. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. What do you hear? What do you see? What do you want to say to Jesus on the cross today? Let's join our prayers with the prayer of the criminal hanging next to Jesus, singing, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home.
the third word, the word of relationship. On Raymond Island, beside the Gippsland Lakes, I came upon a mother swan sitting on her nest with a pair of cygnets exploring their new world around her. One of them must have been very recently hatched because he was unsteady on his feet, constantly tumbling over. From time to time the mother would reach out with her long neck to steady her child. My heart was touched by this beautiful new family. In John's Gospel, Jesus calls a new family into being while hanging on the cross. He entrusts his own mother and his beloved disciple to one another. A new family created in his death, a family that transcends marriage structures and genetics, a family of faith and love for the new creation. In this time of pandemic, our time of separation from each other, here is a pointer to the community of which we are all a part and by which we are all connected. The family of God which transcends space and time. A family born at the cross. Jesus says, Woman, here is your son. As Jesus calls a new family into being from the cross, let us pray for his family in all the world in this time of separation and isolation. Let's pray for all God's children in need during this pandemic. Let's pray for the family of creation the world that God loves so much. Crucified Jesus, hear our prayers for the earth and all its creatures, for the water, the air, the rocks, stones and soil, the oceans, mountains, forests and deserts. Hear our prayers for people everywhere, those at war within and without, those hungry and thirsty in flesh and spirit those sick at heart or sick in body and mind, those mourning loved ones, those grieving lost hope. Hear our prayers for your family, the church, those who follow the way of the cross and carry their own crosses, those who struggle to be faithful in a world that says faith is worthless, those who fall and fail but know the grace that heals and makes new. Let us pray the words that Jesus taught his people to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fourth word, the word of abandonment. Whenever I have stopped and looked at buildings that have been burnt down in the fires, it has felt like a terrible invasion of privacy. We usually keep our loss behind the closed doors of our lives. We shelter inside with our grief. 
but the fires have torn down the walls and the loss is out there to be seen by any passerby. Even though I received permission to capture and share images of this elderly man's shed, I felt uncomfortable doing so, like I was tromping around on the sacred ground of his family's grief. The rain falling felt like the tears of creation. The shed held precious possessions and memories like his prized vintage tractor. And while the beautiful mud brick house which is mere metres away from this ruin was saved, so much else was lost. And having to walk past the wreckage every day is hard. It compounds the grief. I see these nails, like the nails through the flesh of Christ into the charred wood of his cross. And I hear him cry, a cry that resounds in everyone and everything that is lost. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? What do you hear? What do you see? When and how have you felt abandoned? Who do you see being abandoned in our world? Let us join in a contemporary version of a traditional Good Friday prayer, the reproach of the cross. Christ experienced spiritual abandonment on the cross, so let's listen to his voice from the cross, remembering the ways the world has turned its back on him. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I brooded over the abyss. With my words I called for creation. But you have brooded on destruction and manufactured the means of chaos. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I breathed life into your bodies and carried you tenderly in my arms. But you have armed yourselves for war, breathing out threats of violence. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I made the desert bloom before you. I fed you with an open hand. But you have grasped the children's food and laid waste fertile lands. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I abandoned my power like a garment, choosing your unprotected flesh. But you have robed yourselves in privilege and chosen to despise the abandoned. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. 
A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. The fifth word, the word of bodily distress. East Gippsland has been thirsty country. Years of drought prepared the way for the fires. Now the rains have come, but we are still thirsty here. The coronavirus pandemic has us thirsting for human connection. Jesus asks for a drink twice in the Gospel of John. Once near the beginning from the Samaritan woman at the well, and once here near the end on the cross. In both cases, through his thirst, he offers himself as the source of the living water of the Spirit. Here on the cross, a soldier thrusts a spear into his side to make sure Jesus is dead. And like the breaking of the waters in childbirth, blood and water come gushing out from his thirsty body. Mystery of mysteries. New life is born through his death, like the rains bringing green from the parched earth. Jesus says, I am thirsty. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. The sixth word, the word of completion. After an autumn rain shower, I go outside and on the branch of a tree come upon a mess of decaying leaves matted together with a tangle of spider webs, an ugly spider nest. And I would have looked away but in its messy ugliness, I notice the beauty of raindrops suspended. And then with the magnifying assistance of my macro lens, I see through the raindrops, the beauty of creation around, turned upside down, as if the raindrops themselves contain a new upside down world. In John's Gospel, Jesus dies with a statement of satisfied completion on his lips. It is finished. I have done it. My work is perfectly completed. Over and out. But seeing him hanging there in the messy ugliness of human suffering, violence and injustice, I would rather look away. There is no beauty here. But can I see in him the possibility of a world turned upside down? 
Suffering turned to healing. Violence turned to peace. Injustice turned to love. Could beauty be born here in the last place it might be expected? Jesus says, It is finished. What do you hear? What do you see? Let's take some time now to reverently acknowledge Christ's suffering by touching his cross. I invite you to take and hold or touch the cross that you have. And let's pray together. What is touching you today? in the suffering of Christ. Tremble, tremble, tremble. Oh. 
It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. The seventh word, the word of homecoming. The bushfires silenced the bush. Birds stopped singing there. But now, months later, on the margins from unburnt areas Birds have started to make their way back. This bronze wing pigeon is perched on a burnt branch in a scorched part of Malakuta, returning from where it came to where it belongs, coming home. On the burnt branch of the cross in Luke's Gospel, Jesus gives up his life with the words of Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. A prayer of faith and trust in God from a place of distress. And with these words, Jesus returns from where he came to where he belongs, to his home in the heart of divine love not a distant place, but a place right here in the midst of human struggle. May we join Jesus in making the psalmist's prayer our own. Jesus says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Strange. 
nature gave. What may I say? Heaven was his home, but mine the tomb wherein he lay. Here might I stay and sing, no story so divine. Never was love, dear King, never was grief like thine. This is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. With the women who followed him, let us continue listening and watching. What will we hear? What will we see? Watch and listen prayerfully as our worship continues in our hearts for the rest of Friday and Saturday. This is not the end of this service. It, it couldn't end here. It comes to fulfillment in the great celebration on Easter morning. And so, until then, go in peace. As Christ has loved you, love one another. Amen.